Hello everyone and a warm welcome to Expert Talk series powered by Cred Avenue. My name is Shubham Jain and I lead the infrastructure and real estate port, uh, platform at Cred Avenue. Cred Avenue is India's largest institutional debt platform with having assisted more than 2500 issuers and raised around rupees 85000 odd crores of loans for these companies from a diversified set of investors. Cred Avenue's product suite includes <coughs> loans, bonds, co-lending, securitization and supply chain finance. For today's discussion, I am joined by an eminent infrastructure expert, Mr. Vinayak Chatterjee. I am sure Mr. Chatterjee would be known to every person who tracks infrastructure sector. Mr. Chatterjee did his MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. Then he co-founded Feedback Infra Private Limited in 1990 and served as its chairman from 1990 to 2021. Since stepping down from active management, he now devotes his time and energy to infrastructure policy, advocacy, and capacity building. He is on the board of various eminent companies like Elint Infotech, etc. And also, he is currently the chairman of CIA's National Council on Infrastructure. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you, Shubham. Thank yeah. you. So, just to set the ball rolling, so would like to really get a sense on what are your views on the current macroeconomy uh, uh, indicators and how do you think that infrastructure sector has performed over the last four or five years? We have seen a lot of government's intervention in terms of policies in terms of support to the sector so what's your overall view on the sector i think the first part of your question uh, about infrastructure and its link to the macro economy is probably the best starting point it is very clear now that the government has very clearly made up its mind that it is the expenditure and investment in infrastructure that is going going to pump prime the economy uh, and stimulate gdp growth in fact at one of the recent post budget meetings the secretary of finance dr somnathan made a very revealing statement he said that the government of india had very credible research reports that said that 1 rupee spent on infrastructure or public works result in 3 rupees of gdp whereas the same 1 rupee of government spend on direct benefit transfer of let us say putting money in 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 the pockets of a consumer result in 90 paisa of gdp now while there are many voices that talk about lesser allocation to infra and more towards social schemes and certainly they have their logic but it is very clear that the government stand on putting massive amounts of resources as seen in the last budget and generally other policies into infrastructure is possibly the right thing for this economy and has the highest multiplier effect the next question to link with the macro economy is what is the right level of infrastructure investment for the country for any country there is no there is no one answer uh, over time economic historians have tracked that the index called gcfi gross capital formation in infrastructure as a percentage of gdp is possibly the best measure of gdp and different countries at different life cycles of the economy uh, have revealed different levels of spend for example china and for that matter many southeast asian economies at the height of their growth stage have gone as high as 11% gcfi uh, but by common consent from the time this issue was squarely addressed in the 11th and 12th plan uh, by the planning commission and by the upa government there seems to be a reasonable convergence across political parties and across economists and uh, policy uh, types that around india around 8 to 9% of gcfi is an appropriate investment that india should make so the question is are we somewhere near that level now if you see the national infrastructure pipeline nip yes it postulates 111 lakh crores of infrastructure spend over 5 years yes very roughly that's about 22, 22. lakh crores per annum now the real the the nominal gdp today is somewhere around 240 lakh crores okay. so when you see 22 upon 240 you will see it is around 8 9% and even if you do not so well for other reasons it will certainly be at the levels of 7 7.5%. So at a broad macroeconomic level we are in the spend on infrastructure and the level of spend on infrastructure is directionally correct. 
But let me stop here. Sure. I think it's a very relevant point which you have made here. Uh, 20 lakh crores or 22 lakh crores is possibly the ideal spend that we should be doing to achieve the ambitious NIP. But we, if we see in the history or the last five years also, the average spent on infra has been somewhere around 10 to 11. Okay, we were also impacted with COVID, which was totally a black swan event. And there were also other issues in the economy which we were dealing with. So there is a significant catch up that one has to do because NIP was also launched, launched pre-COVID. At that time, it was not envisaged that we will get stuck with uh, something like this. So now to bridge this gap, do you have any pointers in your mind? Look, this gap, what you said 10-12 is correct up to 2019. But the figures uh, are not yet out for 2021 or 21-22. Yeah. And I am given to understand that we may be closer to 14 to 16 lakh crores. Sure. So the extent of the gap that you are talking about has narrowed. But the fundamental point that you have made that there is a gap between 22 and uh, what we've achieved and that gap needs to be narrowed. Now, the two issues in infrastructure to narrow the gap, let's look at two major drivers. One is, is there enough capital to fund the required infrastructure? And the second is, is there enough pipeline of a project? Definitely. Of projects? Yes. So let's look at the first one. The first one is actually very revealing because most discussions about infrastructure have largely 90% of the discussions in infrastructure and you've been uh, 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 you know a key player in that for a large portion of your career uh, has been does India have the financial capability to invest such large sums the answer startingly is that India has reached a level of financial capacity and capability and I will tell you how take at the take look at the various buckets of financing capacity the union budget this year has set aside 7.5 lakh crores. Now, the thumb rule is that states normally do an equal amount, equal amount. but I'm actually taking less yes. because of the fiscal stress in the states. And let's say the states do 6 lakh crores. So, 7.5 plus 6, you've reached 13.5. Take extra budgetary resources and PSUs. Add another 3 lakh Three. crores there, right? You've reached 16.5. Then you add uh, uh, private capital. Private. Uh, and domestic and private capital and you will see that and add another 2 lakh crores from the newly instituted NABFID, National Bank for yeah. Financing Infrastructure Development. When you add this up, you will see that we are very comfortably placed to have crossed the 20 lakh okay. crore fin financing uh, barrier. Union government, uh, extra budgetary resources and PSUs, states, domestic and foreign private capital. I don't know whether I mentioned it at yeah, around yeah. 3 lakh crores and NAPFID currently at 2. So you are very close to 20, 22 lakh crores. So the revealing fact is that India today has reached a certain level of maturity in its ability to fund infrastructure. Sure. However, the concern is gradually shifting to project execution and the availability of project pipeline. Now look at a very simple maths. Uh, the normal life of an infrastructure project is about four, four years. years. It could be seven years, it could be three years, but let's take four. Uh, it's, it's probably an overestimate, but let's take four, lakh, uh, four years. Which means that to put 20 lakh crores on the ground every year in shovel-ready projects and for the money on the ground to actually translate into demand for construction, labor, steel, cement, etc., you will then require a pipeline four times that. So you require a pipeline of 80, 80 lakh crores so that you are able to bring down 4 lakh crores, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 20 lakh crores, every one fourth year. of them out every, every year year's to actually deploy the funds. The billion rupee crore question, I can't say multi-million dollar, uh, is does India have a ready pipeline of 80 lakh crores? No way. We honestly don't have precise figures of what the project pipeline is, hmm. right? The national infrastructure pipeline attempts to chart such a pipeline. Uh, but the best guess estimates or back of the envelope calculations today reveal that India today probably has an investable pipeline of around 50 to 60 lakh crores. We are short. And, and, and this is this is an optimistic estimate. We are short 
and much of this will get consumed in the next two years. Two years. Forty lakhs will get consumed in the next two years. Mm -hmm. So sixty will become twenty. Are we adding? We today need a new generation of projects, which will certainly add a bulk infusion of forty to fifty lakh crores of fresh projectization to add to the pipeline. In a situation where funding capacity is not the effective constraint, the effective constraint is gradually becoming the availability of shovel-ready projects. Most economists, most public uh, policy experts, actually miss this point. And when I make this point, they stand up and say, "Oh yes, but we've never really applied our minds to this." So, creating a new generation of projects and speedy execution, because even if you have projects. And instead of four years, it takes six or seven years. Then once again, you're back to the game that there are not enough shovel-ready yes. projects. So, speed of execution and development of a new generation of projects seems to be where the discussion is shifting to. Now, that's a very, very interesting point that you have uh, brought forward. That more than funding, which used to be a huge cry, possibly seven, eight years back. Now we have made, I think, significant progress on that. now where we are lacking is the availability of shovel ready projects but my point here is that to get such a strong pipeline that would require huge efforts on the government's part to get that land acquisition row to put that money yeah. so are we ready for that you know your question is apt and it is a very loaded question if you see india has managed to overcome the hurdles you mentioned in the national highway development program right right all the issues you mentioned land acquisition removal of utilities state support agreements things that you are familiar with yes have all been managed to the extent that we are now almost ready to reach 40 kilometers a day right probably the highest in the world on a consistent basis similarly on electricity transmission we have been able to overcome uh, right of way issues in some very very difficult terrain also So it is not that India cannot do it. Uh, railway electrification, while it didn't uh, require right of way, but it required tremendous amount of wire laying to 100% electrify Indian railways, which will be achieved in 2024. So these kind of projects, India has demonstrated a capacity once it applies its mind. So the point is that there are still challenges. Yes. and there are the, the history has taught us that there are different ways of handling these challenges for example what we have been advocating from cii is very simply that the government should not issue tenders for construction or development until all permissions including land acquisition including removal of utilities is all completed and then only and that is the responsibility of the sovereign it is not the responsibility of the private sector so what is a simple way to achieve this a simple way to achieve this is what is called plug and play if you are doing a major project let us say you are doing uh, a large uh, new logistics park right or a new power plant then the government should house that project in a 100% sarkari owned spv mm. government should own 100% of the shares and under that company's identity which is a 100% government entity with a ceo who is mandated within a period of time to secure all the permissions finish the land acquisition and finish all the functions that the sovereign is best poised to do then sell the shares of that spv to the highest bidder right so the sovereign discharges its functions which are sovereign functions and the private sector then takes the private sector risks which are related to market facing related to construction and related to operations so plug and play which is what this is colloquially called is one of the nicest ways to do it and if we are looking at a new generation of projects then we would strongly recommend that the government both central and state uh, use this method of stand alone spvs 100% owned to clear all sovereign clearances and then pass on a on a clean slate uh, the ready project for implementation so that's one of the ways there are other ways but yes the the challenge also intellectually is to conceive of a new generation of projects now are they going to be uh, uh, very large coastal economic zones are they going to be 100 smart cities are they going to be new state capitals are they going to be a new generation of river linking or major irrigation projects like the ken betwa uh, river linking project uh, are they going to be regional rapid rail projects more metro rail 
there are a variety of things that can be done in the infrastructure sector. So the challenge now is to conceive and move along with the next generation of projects. So this is this plug and play model, the new morphed form of PPP? Well, it is beyond PPP because even if it is EPC, we believe that the 100% SPV called plug and play is appropriate even for alternative formats like hybrid annuity. Uh, take, take, uh, take the effluent plants on the Ganga cleaning program, right? Mm. They are under the ham format and there are 67 such plants coming up. But all of them will have issues of land acquisition, yeah, yeah. connectivity to the municipal sewer lines to clean the sewage, pump it into the Ganga, environmental clearance, forest clearance, uh, all that kind of stuff. So even if it is ham, which is hybrid PPP, not straightforward, yes. uh, the plug and play model works. Conversely, if you want to uh, develop New Delhi railway station into a massive new world class station development program, and let's say you even want to do it on an EPC basis. You will need all the municipal clearances, the removal of obstacles, the approval of the master plan, the linkages of all sewer, water, passenger, flyover, parking, uh, multi-level car park. You will require a battery of stuff and permissions. Now, are you going to, even on EPC mode, are you going to leave all of that to the private contractor? Or should a plug and play model where a new New Delhi station development corporation, 100% owned, gets all the clearances including Delhi Urban Arts Commission and various other things and then says guys I have got everything ready now I'm putting it up for bid right and then you'll also get the best rates because people will take you know uh, will have uh, uh, will have to deal with less risk less risk so con continuing on the discussion on this private sector uh, investment in infrastructure sector so we have seen significant amount of interest from uh, foreign investors, private equity firms, etc. But everyone is interested in taking operational, stabilized projects. No one is really wanting to take a greenfield or a brownfield uh, exposure to India. Again, because of the various risk points that we have been discussing. Now, challenge is that if we look at the list of Indian developers who have the balance sheet strength or intention to take exposure uh, to new projects, PPP or plug and play, do we have that kind of depth uh, in the no. system right now? No. Even if there is balance sheet capacity, the investment appetite for PPPs is not there. Is not there. In fact, from the biggest corporate boardrooms that have the ability to invest in mm. their balance sheet money in PPP projects, the mood is somber because of the past experience, experience. on PPPs. Correct. It's a vast subject and we all know that there have been huge concerns on uh, contracts, uh, sanctity, on level playing field, on unlevel playing fields, on inappropriate risk allocation, on lack of support on the last P in the partnership. There are a variety of issues. So your question is best answered in the short term to medium term because it has to be addressed. In the short term, what should be done is for new projects, let the government build the projects on EPC mode, hmm. right? Uh, large portion of the dedicated freight corridors, eastern and western are on that mode, many other projects. And now that the government has a twinning policy of national infrastructure pipeline, pipeline. And twinned NMP. with NI, national monetization pipeline, and NMP. NMP. So the best model is what originally was called the Mumbai Pune Expressway model, hmm. that let the government build, get the risks out, and then sell the asset and which is what it should be doing because as you are right Indian balance sheet large corporates with large balance sheets with an interest in infra are not going to be investing in greenfield infra and the foreign funds are interested in brownfield Brown operating, operating assets. assets so in this context actually what this government has done is done the correct thing and it is exemplified by the way NHI has grown in the last few years NHI's debt has risen as you well know yes. But that debt has been used to create assets, assets. under EPC. Yeah. BOT used to be 85% in 2012. It is less than 5% today. Largely it is EPC and some amount of ham. So if you see the NHI model, that exemplifies the way government should move in the short term. Raise government resources, debt or otherwise, and invest in the EPC mode. As the projects are ready, or yesterday's projects that were ready, Keep monetize them and roll the cash. 
at the same time be very friendly in terms of inviting foreign investors and domestic investors in monetizing brownfield assets. It's been a very, this combination of NIP, NMP has been smart for two reasons. One, it is economically smart that it builds and monetizes, but it is politically smart also because the government recognizes the market realities. Sometimes government is blind to market realities. But in this case, they recognize that the market realities are such that the appetite for greenfield investments is poor. So then let's not bark up that tree till we have sorted out that space and keep the show going. Now, this important phrase I use, till we have sorted out that space, what is the sorting out required? And you know that I have been one of the fairly loud votaries of some drastic resetting of PPP yes. into a version 2, yeah. 2.0. Version 2.0 actually is all the more relevant now. And let me go back to some maths again. 40% of the NIP, that is 40% of 111 lakh crores, 44 lakh crores. And 100% of NMP, NMP is nothing but PPP. That's 6 lakh crores for the next 4 years. So 44 and 6, in the next 5 years, the government is looking at 50 lakh crores of private capital coming into infrastructure. Right? Yeah. Huge amounts for guys like yes. you also. Now in, in Cred Avenue, you've got to raise 50 lakh crores now, <laughs> yes. right? From we'll all your from all your uh, people that you've got on your on your on your panels. Sure. So big task you have, Shubham. You lead the charge now, uh, and and lead and and raise 50 lakh crores of PPP. But for you to do that, what the government needs to do is to reset the PPP framework. Most importantly, recognize that the program PPP requires a reset. You know, first is this realization that there is a problem. Then you can solve it. It is not that the government has not realized there is a problem. When this government, when NDA government came to power in 2014, it had inherited a downslide of PPP interest that started in 2012. Yes. So what did it do in 2014? It, it was very interesting for your listeners that in the first budget speech of Sri Arun Jaitley in July 2014, one of the key paragraphs was that we are setting aside rupees 500 crores to create an institution called 3T India. Yes. Why did Jaitley Saab with his wisdom and insights see the need for 500 crores to create a world-class institution called 3P India? It is to reset the PPP frameworks and bring the best of knowledge and talent in. Unfortunately, it didn't move forward. However, the same government next year in 2015, mid-year 2015, appointed the Kelkar Committee. The committee headed by the eminent Finance Secretary, Economist Dr. Vijay Kelkar had eminent people on the committee and submitted a report to the best of my knowledge in November 2015, in fairly early in the game of, of NDA, yeah. say report of the Kelkar committee on revisiting and revitalizing PPP. That book is a delight, that report. It lists A to Z every large and small thing that is required to reset the PPP framework. Now, the government has never really acknowledged its acceptance of part or whole of that report. Although in casual conversation, they recognize the worth of many of the suggestions. So, the point I'm making is that recently, the last budget speech, the Honorable Finance Minister, Madam Sitaraman, did make the point in one of the budget speech that we are going to be investing heavily in capacity building capacity. for PPP. So the need is there, but with the need there, the question is, we are now looking at timely action. And I'm going back to maths again. So I just made the point that the expectation is 50, 50 lakh, lakh crores crores. across the next five years. Divide that by five years, 10, 10 lakh, lakh crores, crores. Per, per annum. And what is the current run rate? 2.5. 2.5 so you are expecting 2.5 to go to 10 without resetting the, the stage, you want four times more dancers to come on the stage, you need a different stage. So it is imperative and I hope this recording carries this message loud and clear that the need of the hour is to urgently reset PPP frameworks institutionally and on the ground in terms of people who are implementing it. And the positive thing is that I understand that post the budget speech, the I have, I have had the opportunity to have a chat on this matter with the current secretary department of electronic uh, department of economic affairs uh, and he has committed that one of their key programs this year is to unleash a major program on uh, institutional reform and capacity building of ppp so let's see how that goes sure. so since you mentioned about the budget speech 
सो दिस इयर्स बजट स्पीच वॉज हाईली डोमिनेटेड बाय गति शक्ति इनफैक्ट पी एम गति शक्ति सो फॉर आर व्यूअर्स इफ यू कैन एक्सप्लेन द कंसेप्ट ऑफ गति शक्ति इट विल बी रियली हेल्पफुल ओके सो स्ट्रेंजली अनाफ आई स्पोकन टू अलॉट ऑफ पीपल and while everybody talks about what little they have learnt of gati shakti nobody quite knows as and that's why you asked the question not everybody knows the width and depth of gati shakti right let's take a step backwards what used to happen in earlier years in earlier years you used to set up a hydro power plant in the northeast and in the process of development the power plant the the dam is ready the water body is ready and then you find that there is no the transmission line there, yeah. in many cases there not even a road to build a power plant you set up a renew large renewable power plant uh, re- renewable facility in rajasthan and there is no evacuation transmission line right you set up a major port or even a minor port and there is no road connectivity to even take a large container load of a truck so there are innumerable cases where projects were set up in isolation without the appropriate okay. linkages it has it was also very difficult in network infrastructure to look at alignment let us say you are doing you are doing the delhi mumbai road or the delhi amritsar jammu katra road it has to cross rivers it has to cross railway lines it has to bypass reserve forests habitation cities etc there wasn't very clear mechanism of alignment it was like yesterday's people would go and stand and survey the land and that kind of stuff so there was and projects were also suggested in isolation that somebody the ministry of ports and shippings would say i would like to build a port there without great thought on connectivity and ministry of roads would say i am building a national highway that passes 50 kilometers from that port but doesn't touch the port so there wasn't synergistic convergent thinking therefore these were the ills what is gati shakti gati shakti is nothing but a very complex software program developed by an central government institution called bisag which is located between amdabad and gandhinagar bisag is a very specialized institution under the ministry of information technology and their specialization is in using satellite based technologies to achieve interlinkages and that kind of stuff on the ground so what has bisag designed gati shakti to start with is a layer of software which is layer by layer right think of a cake with different layers each layer represents an infrastructure linkage so going below the ground are water pipeline gas pipelines optic fiber on the ground is roads, roads. rail top is electricity lines right on top are probably even satellites orbits so gati shakti is a massive software program that has layers of infrastructure linkages and what are the and what are they linked to they are linked to economic clusters take a city like kanpur if you want to build a new industrial park in kanpur or around that area then gati shakti will tell you in each layer what are the linkages required bijli pani road rail electricity broadband so it provides at one shot a holistic development of a project so that it is not left orphaned after development simultaneously when a ministry or a department is putting up a proposal right for a rail link or a road link or a power plant then the the current practice is that gati shakti has a group of dedicated trained officers called the national planning group okay okay and the your project should pass through the gati shakti system to get a tick mark to see that all linkages have been cleared and if those linkages are not cleared then finance is not going to approve or the cabinet committee of uh, economic affairs is not going to sanction a big project unless all linkages are not only established but are found to be viable and taken care of right so now this is what gati shakti is in simple terms somebody who is a software expert will give you a more complicated answer sure. but this is what it achieves it is a it's a completely different way of managing the development of infrastructure in the country 
not only at the construction development stage but but also at the monitoring stage when the implementation is underway ki kitna completion hua so this interlinkage play is like the veins of a body you are then seeing a project holistically in terms of all linkages and in its ability to service multiple needs i am not aware of any other country that does its infrastructure development planning as scientifically and as methodically now as india has started to do with kadisha it's 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 almost like a mini revolution in project conception and management and so can we also say that it will be helpful for the lenders and investors in the infrastructure sector because today what happens is as an investor or a lender if i am investing in a road and 5 years down the line a competing state road or a rail link or yes. inland waterways come in i'm my investment yeah. uh, goes to the docks so now getting a long term plan so i'm at least having some kind of a visibility that what can be the state of my project 10 years down the line 15 years down the line so it has removed risk at various levels see at one level it has removed the risk of what you call a competing project Compete. because what will happen now is that in gati shakti you will have a radius as per the shareholders agreement or concession agreement which will say no competing project in a radius of 150 km right so at least that will be mapped and any person who then comes to violate that will be questioned so it removes one level of sure. risk the second level of risk it is it removes is the is that in many cases of private investment the project has been what is called orphaned that i am waiting for the transmission line to be uh, ready yeah. because my uh, renewable uh, is part idle. is ready yeah, yeah. so the the possibilities of orphaning a project because of lack of linkages that risk is also removed so there are various levels of risk that get removed so it's good for yeah. it's good for private investors it's also good for the people of india because yeah, yeah. so much infrastructure is built with your and my money taxpayers money mm -hmm. so in a nutshell we can say that ministries instead of uh, competing with each other will start complementing each other will be forced to will take some to. time to have that mindset but as projects get rejected and go back to the parent ministry because they do not conform to the master plan of gati shakti then people will slowly start yeah, realizing that we live in a connected world and we don't live and work in silos it's a very very big breakthrough it's a very big breakthrough sure sir on the road sector it has been one of the front runners across different segments in the infrastructure but in recent budget surprisingly the borrowing uh, for nhi has been made zero like which may be stemming from the concern that nhi's overall debt has increased to around 3.25 lakh crores various analysts were really looking at it but will it have an impact on the bharat mala pariyojana and this again it's a big part of nip also what are your views on that my personal views that is that it will certainly impact it would be not correct to say because as long as nhi had access to raise debt being a sovereign guaranteed debt being a government of india institution it could raise debt easily yes. and it had the system to convert that debt into projects on the ground so the point is that nhi has done well i wouldn't worry about 3.45 lakh crores of debt or 3.25 because it is matched with the asset creation. asset creation however it is true that with the narrowing of the pipeline of funds availability because of the constraint on oh, further so debt other mess i am one of those who believe that the pace of construction will come down mm. because while the directive is to now build new roads through monetizing monetization takes time it is difficult and it comes in smaller dollars so one invit will be 7000 crores uh monetizing something else selling a road maybe DOT another 4000 yeah. crores so and each of these dollars require far more effort than at one shot raising 20000 crores from state bank yeah. Or, yeah. or so i personally believe that it is going to impact but it is also correct to say that at an institutional level since the debt of nhi also adds to the debt of the government of india there has to be a point where somebody says okay now no more debt let's start monetizing but it does have a uh, impact to say and i am one of those who believe that it will slow down the pace of road construction but in a situation where india has already built a huge network of roads yes. so <coughs> it may be a good thing also to now also have other sectors pick up yeah sure so uh, in uh, in uh, your previous the maths which you were telling us about how we could achieve 22 lakh crores you also mentioned 2 lakh crores coming from the newly constituted dfi 
and that's quite an optimistic view because if we go back in the past there were various initiatives like IFCL IDFs take out financing credit enhancement which have really not taken off in the way as it was envisaged or expected so what really gives you a lot of confidence on this new DFI see what gives me confidence is that the earlier schemes were not actually structured in a manner of what I'd call developmental capital. What India requires is capital for infrastructure, national development, which has economic returns and not necessarily financial returns. I mean, if you go back in history, projects like the Damodar Valley Corporation or Bhakra Nangal or etc. would not have had great financial returns, but over time they gave to the nation very high economic returns because of their multi-purpose use. Now, Developmental finance does not mean that it is money that is not to be spent wisely or does not have an IRR, right? The government is very conscious that NABFID is, being, is to provide developmental capital hmm. and is, has therefore in its charter created a whole lot of uh, facilitative conditions that will allow it to raise the leverage debt very quickly. Right. Uh, not only the sovereign guarantee, but the low cost of sovereign guarantee and the entire political system with Mr. Kamath heading it is very clear that it has to start performing immediately. And already 20,000 crores has been transferred as equity, yes. another 5,000 crores will be transferred, 25,000 can be leveraged nine times. So you have the capacity and uh, what we informally learn is that this year the target that Mr. Kamath has set for himself and his people is to do 1 lakh crore of funding. So. We may, not, we may not see 2 lakh crores this year, but I am confident that under his leadership and the push that the central government is giving to raise the funds which will be safe because it's sovereign denominated and with a lot of positive characteristics in terms of benefits, that NAPFIT will be able to raise that uh, capital and uh, once it does that, then once again the issue comes back to project Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, under this uh, Atmanirbhar scheme uh, to possibly support the companies, the sectors uh, due to COVID impact. There have been a lot of uh, uh, changes or relaxation in bidding criteria, which has led to lowering of entry barriers. Now, what we are seeing in the sector, and especially in the road sector, which is becoming very, very apparent, is the bidding is becoming highly competitive. People are offering discounts of 30-40%, and, and larger players are really crying foul. And, and they are saying, what's happening? So they have been complaining. So do you think there could be a long-term impact that people just for the sake of getting awards now are really bidding aggressively and we go back to situation what we had faced in 2011, 2012? You know, this argument always has two sides. There was a time when bidding criterion were so strict that only a handful of players, and I don't want to take names, could actually qualify. Whereas road building, if sincerely done, is not a very technically complex Definitely. subject, yes. right? Yes. I mean, it is in many senses in engineering terms, very much a commodity product. Hmm. So it is but natural that India would want to encourage and, it, and road construction is also a very regional business. I mean, building a road in the Northeast is not the same as building a road in Kerala. The, the collection of materials, the socio-political climate, the availability of road building equipment, which are very location specific. A contractor who's working in site X would want a neighboring site Y. Yeah. For, so the, it's also a very regional business. And India, luckily, has a spate of medium sized contractors over the years who used to be called PWD contractors. Yes. One of the One leading of the firms. Also. Yes, and subcontractors also. And some of the leading firms like IRB started their journey as very small subcontractors yes. in Thana or somewhere else. And that's the story across the country. Now, many of these firms, because of being allowed to uh, uh, you know, participate in much larger projects, have become very good uh, large sized listed companies. Of course, it has also led to misuse, whereas companies that did not have the financial capital or the technological strength have become over aggressive and bid. So during COVID stage, there were relaxations, but as I understand now, the bidding criteria have again got tightened, but I would still say that we should have a fair balance where Indian companies should be allowed to grow and uh, I was just looking at the names of the contractors awarded the projects on the Delhi Mumbai sector and I was surprised to see that there were only out of some 15 or 20 contractors that I could that I studied 
I only earlier, two or three years earlier, recognized one or two names. Yes. Many names I didn't recognize. But people on the ground tell me that the construction is of superb quality. Mm. So the argument cuts both ways. And therefore, there should be sufficient checks and balances early in the game to say that if someone has bid aggressively and doesn't have the capacity, we should be able to weed them out. Sir, over the last few years, we have seen a lot of initiatives taken by the government, authorities, ministries to eliminate whatever the risk or the issues which really lead to delay in the projects. But if today also we look at MOSPI data on project execution, it really depresses me. Yes. That overall the projects who are running with delay, the cost overruns of 20-25% and never ending cost overrun, it keeps on spiraling. And now with the steep increase in the commodity prices. Now, do you think that the sector is uh, in a position to absorb such a kind of a steep rise? Or we are again looking at elevated number of disputes between the uh, contractors and the authorities going forward. Well, you've hit upon a very live point. My very recent discussion with uh, the EPC contracting community, which largely depends on its existence on Sarkari jobs, is that the recent increase in the price of the, comp the basket of construction materials on a weighted average basis has, depending again on the mix, has been as high as 20 to 26 exactly. percent. Exactly. Whereas the clause in most CPWD and similar contracts uh, provide for an inflation linked increase on running bills which are linked to the index of construction material index. Yes. Unfortunately, I don't know who does the statistics there, but that shows only increases of 6, 7 or 8 percent. So there is a wide gap and most contractors are out of pocket in the current situation exactly. or, and therefore the mood is low because this comes on top of a last two years of liquidity squeeze from the banks and the requirement of bank guarantees and all of that. So the liquidity stresses and strains are pretty heavy uh, other than some very forward looking institutions that pay on time or before time or whatever it is but it's a serious concern and I think that the nature of contracting now needs to change to have a very clear, rational and true linkage between cost of materials and cost of construction. And the private sector is not put to this completely, uh, shall we say, unjustified burden of having to foot an inflationary bill which it had no clue at the time of bidding. So what do you mean to say we should have some kind of index which is more realistic? Which is far more realistic. Somebody immediately needs to do a deep dive and reconstruct the index. And it could be, the index could also be by region and by type of construction. Yes. We need a matrix and we need a very detailed deep dive amongst the experts to create a matrix, uh, region by type of construction and then have a, a, a basket that truly reflects the market pricing of, of construction material. Otherwise, you're going to see more and more people opt out and more and more people get bankrupt. Yeah. Sir, so just continuing this point, slow arbitration system has been the largest pain point of the sector and not only construction sector, I think, across uh, uh, corporate India. And a and lot of large construction plays have gone down. So it's a liquidity spiral in which they get entangled and they have no option but to die. So any thoughts, what are the major two, three points which should be tackled immediately? See, I personally think that fast track courts and or arbitration councils where both parties agree that if we have a dispute this eminent body of people will adjudicate and we both commit that we will not take it to a higher court hmm. right i think this new code of behavior needs to be pushed into the system otherwise this is an old pain point yeah. that doesn't seem to go away Coming on to the surety bonds or, or a new form of possibly intervention which uh, the policy makers have done. Uh, ADI had come out with its guideline, it was also mentioned by the finance minister in the budget speech. So do you think but insurance companies will be enterprising enough to stick their neck out and support maybe, maybe triple B rated companies or they will still restrict giving surety bonds to double A rated which will not really serve the purpose? See that is a question that is waiting to be answered. Because till now, the battle has been won at different levels. First, the battle has been won to convince the government that a product 
like surety bonds, the time has come. Government has accepted it. Then, having accepted it, it has prodded the regulator IRDI to conceive a structure so that insurance companies can introduce the product. Now, we are at that stage where we still are waiting for insurance company to productize their buffet of surety bond products. What I think is that the surety bonds like insurance premium will certainly be priced differently based on perception of risk. Right. Just like your medical insurance yes. is, right? If you are risk prone or had a history of medical issues, then your premium is higher. Yeah. So I, I do not think it's going to be a zero one situation where only triple A or you know double A companies will get it and others will not. But based on a genuine risk perception, the pricing will differ, for which I am perfectly comfortable. So if a mid-sized construction company is found to have it be far more risk prone, its pricing will be higher than a far safer company. Now that's as per pure market economics. In spite of that, my belief is that it will be far better than a bank guarantee. That that same medium sector mm, company yeah. is today forced to pay 30% or 40% margin, margin or cash margin and has this scheme that it can be unilaterally invoked by uh, by the whim and fancy of the of the person it's being given yeah. to it the existing bank guarantee product has too many negatives so even if surety bonds discriminates on pricing between a riskier and a less riskier customer even the person who's paying more is many times better off than the current system of bank guarantees sure sure no a point well taken only thing is when you say that okay the perception of risk then insurance companies do think that they will have some other kind of uh, system to uh, basically come out with a risk metric system or, or they will rely on our conventional rating system? They will rely on rating systems on which you are an expert. And I am aware, Shubham, that you are one of the people who have done seminal work in trying to convert infrastructure rating scales from the conventional yeah. probability of default, default to expected loss. Right. You have been one of the people there and your your move to Cred Avenue is very good for Cred Avenue, but it is a loss for the rating sector. So please carry some of your old learning there. And uh, on, a, on a more serious note, I think that the insurance companies have a very strong actuarial practices, right. but their actuarial experts are trained statistically on life and fire and accident and all that kind of stuff. They do not have Execution the ability, capability. so they will yeah, rely on the on the rating companies, rating companies, but then rating companies must now rise to the occasion exactly. and move to the expected, expected loss, loss trajectory. Uh, Credit Avenue, sir, as a company, we also have a very strong charter of uh, deepening the retail participation in fixed income. Uh, we, we see a lot of uh, retail participation in equities, in real estate, etc., etc. But individuals like you and me, we really don't have a debt portfolio. Right? Because that awareness is not there or, or the options are not there. And, and we have been really trying to originate very safe structures. And just to give you a number, and, and you love numbers, I know. So the total money, retail money in FTs is around rupees 150 trillion, which grows by 10, 12 trillion every year. Like people have to put money, money into every. But there are very good safe structures which will maybe provide you 4 5 percentage better than FD. So do you think this is the right time where retail money can be channelized to infrastructure sector also? I would say wait for a little more time. You see, the first foray in this direction has been INVITS in exactly. and in retail sector has been REITs. There has been a mixed bag of experience. Some of them have done well and some have not lived up to expectations. I think we need to see a little more traction and a certain maturity and settling down of the invits reach types of debt structures, yes. which is what really you're talking yeah. about. And I would give it another three or four years before I would expose it to retail investors. Sure. And just to end the last point from my side, we started our discussion with your views on macroeconomic uh, situation. What are your views on geopolitical situation? Because what is happening between Russia, Ukraine, what is happening in our neighborhood, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. So that is a vast subject. But to purely answer in terms of narrow economic interest, 
what worries me is India's 85% dependence on imported petroleum. Imported petroleum yeah. You know, that impacts from macroeconomics to the micro of a common man's pocket. Yes. Everything else is philosophical discussions. Which way is the world going? How is India doing? And our stance. I don't want to get into that, but I'd say that the quicker we reduce our dependencies on two large areas. On the political front, we reduce our military dependence on Russian uh, equipment and spares. And on the power side, we reduce our dependence on 85% import of hydrocarbons. Uh, to my mind, if we can do these two, we would be well poised in the current uh, global turmoil. Yeah. Sure. Thanks a lot, sir, for your time. Pleasure. It's Thank always you. a pleasure talking to you and learning from you. Thank you. I've enjoyed the discussion. Okay. And Thank to meeting you, you. quite some time. Thank you. Thank you.